Hey, what's up guys? If you're in college right now, you're probably pulling your hair out about how to land that first internship, especially given the current job market. The internship process can be incredibly intimidating, and I know that that's exactly what I was facing when I was a freshman. I had no prior internship experience from high school, and I was so lost and confused. I mean, how do you get internship experience when you don't have any prior internship experience? It's literally the ultimate catch-22. But one that's possible to navigate around with the right tips and tricks, which is exactly the point of today's video. For some context, I graduated this past May from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a bachelor's degree in computer science, data science, and economics. Throughout my college career, I've had the privilege of interning with Lidos, Capital One, Amazon, and TikTok. Today, I'll be discussing these specific categories and how you can optimize your efforts in each and every single one of them. So, Let's get started. So let's start off by talking about classes, the biggest source of your knowledge throughout the internship process. I think the biggest misconception that people have is that you need to get all A's. This is simply not the case. Grades are important, especially if you're considering grad school. However, one thing I noticed when I was in college is that a lot of people sacrificed their learning for the sake of a good grade. Now, you might be a little bit confused. I mean, Sorish. Doesn't getting all A's mean you learned the content? This is not the case. Because getting an A simply means you were able to grind and strategically cram the night before the exam. And with your homework assignments, maybe you cheated, maybe you used Stack Overflow or ChatGPT. Getting an A in no way indicates that you have properly learned the content and are able to apply it outside of the classroom. As such, I encourage all of you guys to take a step back from grades and rather focus on learning. See if you can explain the content of the class to a classmate. If you aren't able to, you probably need to study a little bit more. Once you do optimize for learning rather than grades, you'll notice that the grades come naturally afterwards. And hey, you may get an A- minus or a B plus here or there, but I can assure you that in the grand scheme of things, this does not matter. It simply pales in comparison to the value that you get from properly having learned the content. The classes that have the most relevant information that you'll need during the internship grind are gonna be your introductory data structures and algorithm classes. The specific topics that you need to make sure that you understand front to back and back to front are array lists, linked lists, hash maps, trees and graphs, sets, heaps, stacks and queues, time complexity, sorting algorithms, and searching algorithms. This is by no means an exhaustive list but it is definitely a very good place to start. These are the questions that will come up the most in technical interviews and companies need to make sure that you know each and every single one of these topics. Now, let's talk about the piece of paper that's going to define who you are as a human being for the rest of your life. Just kidding. But the resume is a very important document because it's going to be the first impression that you'll be leaving on the companies that you apply to. So let's make it count. There are five main sections you'll need to think about. Education, experiences, projects, extracurriculars, and skills. The education section is pretty straightforward. One common question I get is if you have to put your GPA here. The rule of thumb is that if it's above 3.0, go ahead. Otherwise, you'd probably be better off without it. For relevant coursework, don't write the actual names of your classes because some schools might have class names like Programming 1 or Introduction to Computer Science. Rather, make sure that you have the keywords like OOP for object-oriented programming, data structures, and algorithms. Also, make sure you put any awards or scholarships you get here as well. Don't forget that the Dean's List is also a worthy achievement to note here. You'll probably notice that the Work Experience section is the largest. Now, don't be intimidated. As a freshman, you're not expected to have a massive work experience, hence the point of this video. So what can you put here? Well, the good news is that you can put any job you've had in high school, even if it wasn't tech related. I worked at Van Heusen. Now for those of you that don't know what that is, it's essentially a store that sells dress shirts, dress pants, suits, and other fancy clothing. In fact, I think I bought this shirt with my employee discount from when I worked there. I was tasked with navigating the floor of the shop and helping out customers that were potentially looking to make a purchase. I explained our product lines to them and even helped them make a choice when they were ready to buy. When I put this on my resume, I made sure to showcase the communication skills that I had acquired because of this job. Another really good option is to get a job on campus. 
whether it's as a peer mentor, working at an IT help desk, or any other building at your school. In fact, the peer mentor one is probably the one that I recommend the most. It's a great way to showcase the fact that you enjoy helping other people, along with the fact that you're able to communicate complicated ideas very clearly. I'm gonna skip over personal projects for now because we'll come back to this section in much more depth in just a couple of minutes. I recommend joining any clubs that you find interesting on campus, especially if they're tech related. Definitely keep an eye out for any software development clubs or other computer science clubs that your school may have. And once you do join, I highly recommend getting a leadership position at them as soon as possible. This is another great way to showcase that you're able to manage a large group of people and have competent leadership abilities. Again, more skills that companies find relevant. The skills section is mainly for the bots that'll scan through your resume after you submit an internship application. That's why it's at the bottom. Feel free to load it up with the relevant technologies for the positions that you'll be applying for. Most positions will list the languages or tools that they expect the applicants to know. Another question I've gotten several times is whether or not to rate how well you know the technologies inside of the skills section. I personally think this is a waste of space and doesn't relay any meaningful information to the recruiters or any bots looking at your resume. What is my five stars looking like relative to someone else? Rather, my rule of thumb is that if you're comfortable using a technology during an interview or during an internship, go ahead and put it on in this section. Otherwise, you'd probably be better off without it. Moving on to the personal projects section, one of my favorite parts because I got to choose every single one that I worked on and it really helps me showcase my genuine passions and interests in computer science. My favorite one was probably training the computer to play Super Mario Bros, which if you wanna learn more about, check out my first video on this channel. Personal projects are a great way to learn a new topic or technology, such as a language, and showcase to potential companies that you're able to learn by yourself in a fully self-driven way. You don't need a professor or a class curriculum to keep you motivated, but rather it's your passion. And this is exactly what companies want. So if you're looking to get started with personal projects, I know it can be a little bit intimidating. It definitely was for me when I got started because I had no idea what to build. I mean, I didn't have any billion dollar app ideas, but the good thing is companies don't necessarily need that. All they wanna see is some passion and some motivation. So in my opinion, the best way to get started with personal projects, if you've never even written a line of code on your own before, is to build a simple web application. My first project was with a good friend of mine. We used Django, which is a Python web framework to create an app that translates Python code to Java. Now, we weren't using any fancy machine learning, which as freshmen, we barely understood. Rather, we used a lot of manual string parsing because we had no idea what we were doing, but it was still fun because we both were learning together. This project really helped me develop my team working skills and it was an incredibly fun experience because I got to achieve it with a really close buddy. If you want to get started on your own project, I'll link a tutorial I created down below for a simple app that takes in a ticker symbol of a stock and returns a graph over its price over the past 30 days. This is a pretty good project to complete within two to three hours, and I hope that you're able to learn a lot about Flask and web technology in general. And for my second recommendation, I would say build a portfolio website where you can put your first project on it. And you can also add your resume and other interests and skills that you might have. Again, on the screen is my personal portfolio website, which showcases all of the projects I've worked on over the past several years. And now once you've had the first two personal projects under your belt, the third and fourth are only gonna become much easier. Also, if you want some more details about the entire pipeline of how to create a personal project, I highly recommend my blog article, which I'll link down below in the description. All you need to do to get started is just to make that first Google search. You'll be greeted with so many different tutorials about virtually any topic that you could think of. Now, a lot of people have asked me if it's worth putting an online course certificate that they've completed on their resume. I've talked to recruiters about this and they've all agreed that the best way to showcase that you've completed a course is to take those skills acquired and then convert them into a personal project. This shows that you're able to do more than just click through a couple of videos, but rather actually learn new content proactively and then directly apply it. Also a big thing that you'll learn by working on a personal project is source control. This is essentially how to manage multiple states of your application's code. Just in case a new feature breaks something, you can easily roll back to previous versions. This tool is used 
everywhere in industry and it's absolutely imperative that you understand it. So there's no better way to learn it than to start coding on your own. One more thing I wanted to point out that's great for personal projects is to contribute to open source projects or projects that other people have already started. Now, learning a new code base can be pretty daunting at times, but it's actually a skill you'll need at your internship, so might as well get started right now. And finally, something that I wish I did in college was hackathons. They're a great way to put a personal project on your resume, along with the fact that you could potentially win some very cool prize money. A great way to stand out at any career fair or if you happen to share it during an interview. Like I mentioned previously, your personal projects don't have to be the next billion dollar idea. They don't even have to make any money at all. However, if you do think that you have the next billion dollar idea, definitely consider starting a startup. Try to grab some buddies off campus and see what you guys can create together. But the one thing to keep in mind is that even more important than the idea are the people that you start the startup with. So make sure that all of you guys have the same values and expectations about where you guys want to bring this startup in the future. Startups are a great way to try to take your personal project and monetize it. You might even get some VC funding along the way. I started a startup called Dine-In LLC my sophomore year with a friend of mine, which essentially took the menus of restaurants and put them on our application so customers could walk by, scan a QR code, and then see the menu right on their phone. It's a pretty simple idea and it's actually very commonplace these days. But during COVID, we thought that a lot of these smaller mom and pop shops that aren't as technologically advanced could very well benefit from this app. We learned a lot along the way. We actually had some paying customers for a couple of months. But when our first idea didn't work, we pivoted our startup to now serve an application for the university itself. The University of Wisconsin contracted us to create an application that tracked the capacity of the dining halls on campus. Again, during COVID, it was imperative for students to know which dining halls were the safest for them. The university paid us a couple thousand dollars to help us maintain the app and for any features that they required. And after our sophomore year, they no longer needed it. However, anytime I would mention this project of mine during an interview, it definitely caught their attention and it led to some very interesting conversations. So if you're looking for a startup idea and you don't know where to look, consider asking your university, see if there's any institution on campus that could benefit from an application being created. It's a great way to show companies that you enjoy giving back to the community that you're a part of. One way to almost guarantee that your resume gets seen in any application that you apply for is to have a referral. And a good way to get referrals is to obviously network. So that's what we'll be talking about right now. LinkedIn is perhaps the easiest way to get started. Simply create an account, enter your school, and see what alumni have made their impact in different companies or areas that you potentially want to enter. Feel free to schedule an informational interview with them and see what advice they have for you. Chances are if you're from their alma mater, they'll be more than willing to help. Obviously, don't be desperate for that referral. Any time that they give you, you should be grateful for, but see if the conversation naturally goes towards that direction. Another great way are the many speaker events that I'm sure your school is going to have. I know that there were a lot of them at Madison. In fact, we've had speakers from all around the globe come and speak about their research, and you'll meet very like-minded people at these events who are also great connections along with the speaker themselves. So definitely keep your eye out on your email inbox or any TVs in the computer science building that displays upcoming events. Career fairs are another great way for you to go out there and meet recruiters and learn about what companies they're working at. It's the perfect opportunity for you to give them your resume and to test your elevator pitch, which is essentially a 30 second tidbit about yourself and your experiences. So let's say that you've been doing well in your classes, you've worked on a couple cool personal projects and you've been going to networking events. Well, all of it's going to be wasted if you get the interview and haven't prepared for it. So let's chat about that now. Prepping for interviews is an extremely rigorous process. You'll have two parts usually. One's the behavioral section and one is the technical section. The behavioral process is pretty straightforward and a simple Google search will return hundreds of sample questions that companies may ask you during the interview. To answer the questions, I recommend utilizing the STAR method. The S stands for the situation or essentially what's going on in the current moment. T stands for task, or the thing that you were assigned to work on. A stands for action, or which actions you took. And R stands for the results, or what was the impact of your actions. Utilizing this framework ensures that the information that you're relaying to the interviewer is structured and easily comprehensible. Let's say the interviewer asked me the following question. What was the time where you worked on a project for a stakeholder? 
my response might have looked something like this. My sophomore year, everything was locked down because of COVID, except the dining halls because of the freshmen. That made eating there pretty dangerous given the large size of the freshman class. My friend and I reached out to the university to see if there was any way we could help. The university said that they needed a way to track the capacities of all of the dining halls on campus. They wanted to share this data on their website in real time, so all of the freshmen could make an informed decision about where to eat safely. Also, because we were students, the university was more than eager to contract us to make the app. My friend and I immediately started on the design document to make sure we understood the requirements. We would regularly have meetings with the dining hall representatives to make sure our app would serve its purpose well. We kept them in the loop during the development process to see how they were liking what we had so far and if they needed any changes. After the app was done and deployed, we had 7,000 freshmen using it, and the load of the dining halls evened out really quickly. The freshmen were naturally more inclined to avoid rush hours and go to the less busier dining halls. Now, the second portion of interviews are going to be the technical section. This is perhaps the hardest part of this entire process. Here is where you'll actually be tested of all of the content that you've learned in your classes. The best website to practice these types of questions are going to be LeetCode or HackerRank. I recommend starting off with the easy problems and then slowly progressing from there. In fact, there's a Discord channel that you can join where it'll tell you what companies ask which questions. It's a very efficient way to prepare for any upcoming interviews you may have. Simply give to the bot the name of the company that you'll be interviewing with, and you'll see a curated list of potential problems. I recommend doing at least two lead code questions a day. One new one, and then one that you've done a couple days ago. The spaced repetition will allow you to start developing a model of how all of these questions interact with one another. In fact, a lot of the times, the question that a company gives you can easily be mapped to a practice one that you've done previously, even if it's not the same question. So the goal isn't to memorize all of the solutions to the problems that you do, but rather it's to recognize patterns and to build up that algorithmic intuition that's critical for tackling a problem that you've never seen before, something that's probably going to happen when you're in the interview itself. Make sure to not spend more than 30 minutes on a question. At that point, you're probably not going to get it, and it well exceeds the time you'd have during an interview to answer it. You'd be better off watching a YouTube video, making sure you understand the solution, and then coming back to it a week later to make sure that the understanding has solidified. One more thing that's worth mentioning is that even before you get the interview, a lot of companies will send you a asynchronous online assessment or an OA, where they want you to complete a couple of questions that are very similar to the ones you see on LeetCode. So your LeetCode skills will definitely come in handy even before you land the interview. Finally, let's talk about the application process and what you can expect, especially if it's your first time here. A lot of companies like Meta, Google, and Uber have specific programs only for freshmen and sophomores, so definitely consider applying to those. And a good piece of advice in general, apply everywhere else as well. As a freshman, you can't really be too picky because any internship experience is better than none. So at this point, buckle up and get ready for some rejection. I promise you, we've all been there. So once you get that string of emails where it's rejection after rejection after rejection, do not lose confidence. I promise you it's just part of the process, but I can't emphasize this enough. Do not hesitate to apply literally everywhere that you see. I'm going to link a GitHub repo down below that curates a list of open internship applications that you can apply to. I definitely recommend using a spreadsheet to keep track of all of the companies that you've applied to and what status your application is currently in. Maybe they've sent you an OA and you want to make sure that you don't forget to do that. A spreadsheet is a great way to keep track of all of those things. Anyways, I know that was a lot of information packed into this video, so don't feel pressured to apply all of those tips right now immediately. Take your time. Try just implementing one tip at a time and just see how your results improve over the next couple of weeks or months. So don't think that it's the end all be all if you don't get an internship next summer. But if there's any questions that you have about anything that we talked about in this video, please feel free to ask me a question down below in the comments. I'll be more than happy to answer them. But for now, good luck on the internship hunt and I'll see you guys next time.